Coming up on Point News, gun violence is a growing concern. We have the story on how Point Park is making sure students are safe. The Stephen Foster statue is coming down, and we're going in-depth in a Point News feature, the story on what's next for the statue. And almost 50 years to the day Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. We have a Point News feature covering the anniversary of his death. Point News starts now. Live from the Point Park University Broadcast Center in downtown Pittsburgh, this is Point News. Good afternoon, I'm Nicole Faxinos. And I'm Wyatt Cree. Gun safety is a major concern since the shooting in Parkland, Florida. I took a look at what is being done at Point Park to help students stay safe. Since 2013, there's been an average of 53 reported school shootings yearly. With 40 school shootings reported this far into 2018, over 40 students and adults have lost their lives. Others injured, traumatized, and nervous for the future. Point News takes a look at how Point Park University is making sure their students feel safe and secure during these unnerving times. The Point Park Department of Public Safety was named one of the top 25 university departments by the National Campus Safety Summit. Chief Jeffrey Besong and his staff work hard to ensure that the students feel secure on campus. Our police officers do work with the City of Pittsburgh. We train every summer for our active shooter. Uh, we also have a scenario which our officers go through as well. So we are very well trained and we are ready in case something would happen on campus. Point Park's public safety also finds importance in educating students on how to handle crisis situations. This is why the university screens an emergency procedures video to incoming students with the acronym ALICE. The name stands for Alert, Lock Down, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate. Chief Bisong hopes that students take away from the video to focus on where they are if something happens. From there, students should try to get out immediately, barricade the room, or react to the intruder if necessary. In addition to the Alice video, Point Park Police recently introduced the Police Training Center. Located in the basement of West Penn, the training center hosts hundreds of scenarios for both the officers to learn and to also educate the university about. The use of force scenario trainer system presents situations such as active shooters, basic patrol, and office and classroom safety. Officer Jeremy Bodansky demonstrated just how the scenario generator works. Hello, sir. I'm Officer Bodansky, Point Park University Police. Yes, you have an open container in Officer your Bodansky with you. also Good confirms day. that the simulator will eventually open to wider audiences at the university, including the criminal justice program and for the use of instructions to students and faculty. With all the training and resources to help students be prepared for crises, Chief Jeffrey Bisong hopes students will always remember their street smarts. To make sure they are aware of their surroundings, make sure that they follow the Alice protocol not just here at school but if they're in church or if they're at a movie theater you know you have to make sure you know your whereabouts and what to do and most importantly get out if you can secondly hide and third if um, you have to you have to confront the individual with training and security from the Point Park Department of Public Safety students will continue to feel safe on campus reporting for Point News I'm Wyatt Cree Two to three months. That's how long PennDOT says it will be before Route 30 in East Pittsburgh reopens. A section of the road collapsed early, or excuse me, collapsed during a landslide early Saturday morning, causing an apartment building on Electric Avenue below to also collapse. No one was hurt. Governor Tom Wolf visited the site on Tuesday and said the Commonwealth is doing everything it can do to help the evacuees detour and uh, their detours in. Excuse me. Detours are in place for the drivers. According to a report from the Center for Disease Control, more than 23,000 Americans die each year from infection caused by antibiotic-resistant germs. In a new study, the CDC has found that new germs have been found in all 50 states across America containing these resistant tendencies. According to the study, the CDC's lab network uncovered 221 instances of germs with unusual antibiotic resistance in 2017. 
The report also indicated that health departments can lead the containment of these new germs by handling the new germs as soon as possible. And now to a Point News feature story. The Stephen Foster statue in Oakland is coming down. We want to turn to Point News reporter Jordan Slabinski for more what's on what's next. There are more statues of dinosaurs in Pittsburgh than there are of women in the city limits. In fact, there are no statues that commemorate African American women in the city of Pittsburgh. However, later this month, that's going to change. Pittsburgh Mayor Bill Peduto has assembled a task force to replace the Stephen Foster Memorial statue right behind me in order to find a better memorial for an African American woman who has impacted Pittsburgh. According to an email from the office of the mayor, Peduto has assembled a task force on women in public art in order to pick a candidate for a statue that will be replacing the Stephen Foster statue on Forbes Avenue in Oakland. The statue is surrounded by not only the University of Pittsburgh's campus, but alleged racist context as well. A poll is being held online for members of the community to voice their opinions. There are statues all over Pittsburgh, and yes, dinosaurs own a fair amount of those statues, like this one next to the Stephen Foster Memorial, a Brachiosaurus next to the Carnegie Museum. And how about these ones from PBG Place in downtown Pittsburgh? Thousands of people walk right by this prehistoric trio every day, but they don't walk by any statues of women at either location. Even memorial statues on the North Shore that commemorate men and women in the military do not accurately represent women in the city. At the Vietnam Memorial on the North Shore, women are only represented as someone welcoming home their husband from war. Terry Baltimore is the director of neighborhood engagement of the Hill House Association and also a member of the board choosing the statue replacement. I think it says that we're not taking into account all of the women in Pittsburgh who've made amazing contributions to life in Pittsburgh. I think the, the dearth of women in public spaces that are honored through public art means that we need to sit back and think about what we value and who we value. Olivia Benson, the Community Engagement Director of the Women and Girls Foundation, is also a member of the board. We have a really great opportunity to make a change here, specifically with the leadership of the mayor's office and also the thoughtful research of Dr. Jesse Ramey. Like, we're at a point where this is a really great opportunity for us to honor some of the women, especially the uh, women of color, the African American women who pr played a prominent role um, in the development of Pittsburgh. And this is a great opportunity to really share their story. One of those stories is Gwen Elliott, one of Pittsburgh's first first female police officers. She also was Pittsburgh's first female police commander, and she founded Gwen's Girls, an organization dedicated to helping young girls in the Pittsburgh area. One of the first, she was in the first group at the police academy that had women, and so they were breaking down barriers in an all-male setting. Gwen Elliott is another one whose legacy is just so impactful to the city of Pittsburgh um, through Gwen's Girls and just her work and really being inspiring and championing and elevating the conversations around black girls. Though her story is one to remember, the only police memorial in Pittsburgh is on the North Shore. This commemorates those killed in action, but the statue is of a male with his dog, and there is no physical representation of women police officers. Another woman who meets the credentials of the board is Selma Burke. Burke was a Pittsburgh artist, and one of her biggest accomplishments was sculpting President Franklin D. Roosevelt's head, which was later used as the artwork for the dime. She did the image of President Roosevelt, but Roosevelt that appears on the dime, and she spent a lot of time encouraging young people in African-American communities to think about the value of art in their lives. So she's somebody to consider. I think that, you know, now when you look at a dime, it's a completely different um, perspective that you have in seeing that her work was so instrumental in the design that's on our currency now. And if you're um, not necessarily a historian, you wouldn't realize that. Though the statue is shrouded in alleged racism, Baltimore and Benson both agree that the statue does not need to be destroyed in order to remove it. They believe it should simply be moved to another location so it is not so prominent on the University of Pittsburgh's campus. Every time I walk through public spaces and pay attention to those, those images, I think, why not a woman of color? And why did it take Pittsburgh until 2018 to think about the fact that there have been women who have been part of social movements, political movements, educational movements, and we never thought that we should hold them up for people to say, oh my God. This week was Inclusive Innovation Week in the city of Pittsburgh. According to a City of Pittsburgh press release, to, co to co commemorate the mayor of Bill Peduto visited 60 businesses in the greater Pittsburgh area to discuss inclusion, diversity, and innovation. 
Point Park University also took its part in this event by hosting a live three-hour broadcast featuring interviews from President Paul Hennigan and Mayor Bill Peduto. Producer and host Josh Krupp said the show was a great success and showed off the strides the city is taking to be welcoming for all. Seven Point Park School of Communication students traveled to Las Vegas, Nevada this past weekend to attend the Broadcast Education Association's annual convention. The convention features speakers and workshops on a variety of topics from diversity in sports journalism to civic journalism, utilizing digital platforms for effective storytelling. Point Park BEA President Josh Krupp was one of the attendees and said, quote, you never know who you're going to run into at the conference or what new technology you're going to find. It energizes us to apply what we learn in our everyday lives back at UView in our work, end quote. The Pay It Forward Club will be hosting a women's shelter drive on Monday, April 16th. A table will be set up in academic hall from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. The table will include hygiene products to be donated to the women's shelter and of Greater Pittsburgh. When students pass by, they are encouraged to make a bag and write a positive note to put inside. According to the club president, Jillian Swavonic, she wants to not only donate hygiene products, but also positivity. When we donate the bags, each woman can receive their own message and personal care items. Friday, April 13th, is the Campus Activities Board annual Cab Cella event in Village Park. The event will feature food, music, and games for students to enjoy outdoors. The annual event will take place from 12 to 4 on Friday. According to Point Park University's website, the Conservatory of the Performing Arts program will be holding an event called Arts and Smarts. This is an arts and entrepreneurship synopsis which will be open to all students on campus. According to the Arts and Smarts website, the day will feature guest speakers who will address topics such as funding, philanthropy, and also innovative entrepreneurship from a dance perspective. The goal of this event is for students to learn how far their dance degree can really take them. Some of these speakers will include Point Park dance faculty members. This event will be held this Friday, April 14th from 10 a.m. until 4.15 p.m. The Humane Society of Westmoreland County is always looking for help and someone to take home a new furry friend. Our reporter Julie Gurnick has a story on how you can help. We are here at the Westmoreland County Humane Society where we are going to take a look inside and see how maybe even you could help one of these animals get adopted and find their forever home. The nonprofit organization opened up here in 1991, followed by the cat house in 2001 and the dog shelter in 2005. The Westmoreland County Humane Society does do a lot of work taking animals in in the community. They also do a lot of work with kill shelters to try to prevent that from happening. If you would like to adopt one of these animals, there is a process you have to go through to ensure the animal is going to a great home. Uh, the process, you would begin with an application, mm -hmm. um, and we do like to have you here on site. We like you to see the dog. We like you to meet the dog here. We have an adoption room. Um, you know, just interact with the dog, see how everything goes. Uh, you fill out an application. You talk to an adoption counselor. If everything goes well that day, you adopt the same day. If you aren't able to adopt right now, there are other ways you can help out. They are a nonprofit organization, so they are always looking for donations, including pet supplies, dog food, dog collars, dog bowls, cat litter, towels, and old newspaper. But you can also donate by attending events and participating in the fundraising and selling raffle tickets. The Westmoreland County Humane Society is open for adoptions from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Fridays, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Saturdays, and noon to 3 on Sundays. There's no adoptions on Tuesday because that is when their walk-in clinic is. Like little Xena here, there's a lot of animals that are looking to get adopted, and even you could save an animal's life. I'm Julie Gurnick reporting for Point News here at the Westmoreland County Humane Society. Thanks, Julie. Now, did you see it Monday night? Snow on April 10th. Oh, my gosh. What is happening? I cannot believe it. <laughs> so three weeks into spring, and it seems like the winter weather just won't let up, at least until now. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at our forecast. 
As you can tell, Thursday today we have a high of 70 with a low of 52, only a 50% chance of precipitation, but it is a little windy out there, so grab a coat. Friday, you can expect a high of 80. Similarly, a high of 79 on Saturday, lows of 59 and 60 with precipitation at 25 and 70. And Nicole, how are we going to round out our weekend on Sunday? On Sunday, we're going to have a high of 74 degrees and a low of 47, but we are going to have an 85% chance of rain. So Sunday is going to be your day to stay inside, but Friday and Saturday do look beautiful. Now we'd like to turn to another Point News feature. April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated. This being the 50th anniversary of his death, Point News reporter Kim Keege takes a look on how he was tied to Pittsburgh. Behind me is what you can see what used to be the Pitt Student Union Building, where Dr. Martin Luther King spoke on his last visit to Pittsburgh. Now in 2018, we remember Dr. Martin Luther King's legacy as the 50 year anniversary of his assassination is remembered. In Washington, I heard that. You know, uh, we have a dream speech, uh, which just mesmerized hundreds of thousands of people that day. Uh, I wasn't even close enough to see him, but you could hear it on the loudspeakers, and it was just, it was beautiful, beautiful to hear. That would be the last time Lawrence Glasgow heard King's beautiful voice. Thank you, Mr. Randolph. I would simply like to say that I think this has been one of the great days of America. And I think this march will go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, demonstrations for freedom and human dignity ever held in the United States. There was a lot that was going on in those, in those times that uh, were really very, uh, made it a very special time. But During those times, a pivotal moment of history included the National Mourning Day for Martin Luther King after his assassination. A march that was proposed to, um, to commemorate King and the police were not sure they wanted to have a march, they, that they wanted to have a gathering, but the march did take place. Charles Martin, a Pittsburgh photographer, captured the iconic images from the Pittsburgh Peace March that allow us to relive history. Those moments include uh, KDKA radio reporter George Barber interviewing uh, a man and his daughter um, at there at the uh, at the start of the march. Um, that to me was a very important photograph uh, because George Barber was an African American reporter and here he was interviewing a, a white man and his daughter participating in the march. But it wasn't just the year of 1968 that King inspired Americans to come together. He continues to inspire the next generation. Here in Market Square, this is where the next generation of Pittsburghers became unified as one. During the March for Our Lives event, which advocated for stricter gun control after the Parkland school shooting in February. The Parkland, that march on Washington that the, the young people organized, that was, that was getting, getting at that. That was an inspiring, inspiring day and the young people were just marvelous there. In fact, they inspired hundreds of thousands of people to be present in Washington, D.C. for the March of Our Lives. Peyton Klein, the recipient of Coro's Martin Luther King Innovation Leadership Award, was just one of the young people making a change as she participated in the National School Walkout. I was out of the country during the March for Our Lives. I wish I could have participated. I was marching right there um, from the other side of the world, but um, I did participate in the walkout. Uh, and it was extremely motivating and inspiring to see so many young people and so many of my peers taking action um, and calling for change. Klein says it is because of the path Martin Luther King paved that change is possible today. So many youth activists stand up, especially with the March for Our Lives. So I think that Martin Luther King and everything that he does, well, first of all, the work that we're doing now would not be possible without the advancements that Dr. King made but um, that he provides a source of inspiration for the students standing up um, to be the advocates uh, that our country needs.
Her organization, Global Minds, is paving the way to helping the next generation of leaders. Global Minds, we're a for youth, by youth organization, and we bridge native English speaking students and English as a second language students through activities about human rights, diversity, sustainable development, and international relations. That's all paired with conversational English practice to help act as an educational support system for ESL students and then to better educate native English speaking students in order to create more globally minded young. Bringing change is continuing to keep Dr. King's legacy alive. 2018, there is still a need to let freedom ring. And that is how we will uphold his legacy. And that is how we will create one life and meaning to his death. And that does it for this week's Point News. Be sure to join us next Thursday live at 2 p.m. Have a great week, Pittsburgh.